Um, so welcome everyone to our Talk Digital in uh, the end of March. So we started doing these virtual ones uh, about a year ago. So we kind of progressed quite a way. So we'd like to welcome um, tonight. We've got Simon Hickling, who's our chief architect. Uh, we've got Bern and we've got Aaron, who are our, our partners from Commander. So Simon, over to you if you want to. Yeah, uh, just a, a quick intro on, on on why we're here and, and what we're doing. Um, at Caveo, we're looking to re-engineer uh, a number of our systems and looking at how we can improve our time to change um, in terms of getting the business doing things the way they want to do and, and getting them what they want to do. And we, we looked around and looked at different process, uh, business process management tooling um uh something that i've worked in for a few years myself and looked at Commander, and it came out as one of the the best options uh, so we're we're moving on using Commander, and what we're looking to do is improve our process automation so that we relieve people from doing the boring stuff and also looking at enhancing our decision making within it uh, and so this is going to go through uh, with burned talking about what Commander is and how we can use it. And then I'm going to go through some of what we're doing um, at Kavea in terms of making that real. I'll hand over to you now, Bernd. Awesome. Thank you, Simon. Um, I have to ask this. Do you, can you see my screen? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yes, awesome. <laughs> Very good. I, <laughs> I'm quite tired of asking that. And one time I didn't ask it and then I forgot to, to share. So <laughs> I'm back at asking it again. Yeah, and, and the plan was um, to talk a bit first about what's process automation, what's decision automation. And um, first things first, I've set up a Slido um, yeah, page for that. I'm not sure if you know Slido. But um, what you can do is you could use um, that nice little QR code with your phone and that brings you to a Slido page um, where you can basically ask um, questions. And if you ask questions, you can also rate other questions. I mean, we're not such a huge group, so we might even uh, can handle chat. So if you, if you don't want to go to Slido, I think we can handle that. But I love Slido because then we can really go through um, the questions at the very end in a very structured way which normally is much more fun than just like um, scrolling through the chat all the time. So if you if you could go to Slido, that would be um, super awesome. Um, yeah, Simon already said, what's the plan? I start talking a little bit, then comes the interesting part of the Simon talking about what they're doing for real, and then we kind of wrap it up. So um, I wanted to give a very quick introduction and I'm, I, I try to make it actually very brief. Um, to just bring everybody up to speed, what's process automation in this case, um, and how I see process automation. Um, so in essence, the, the idea is always about um, processes. Very often these are business processes. Sometimes these are integration processes, but we have certain processes, which basically means we have certain tasks in a specific like sequence, I say, for example, um, this is customer onboarding. We find that in, in every industry, so um, could be insurance, could be banking, could be a telecommunication, whatever. You have a new customer and you basically want to sign it up. This is for telecommunications. And then it could say like, okay, what I have to do first, I have to enter it in the CRM system at the same time in parallel also in the billing system. When both is done, I can trigger the SIM card provisioning and register it. It's super simplified. Um, and then you can start instances of this process to flow um, basically through that process model, what you can see, this is BPMN, that's an ISO standard to define these kind of processes. So um, I will show all of that live in a, in a second. Um, so it's not only a lovely picture, it's also in the background, it's an XML file with a lot of like execution semantics, a lot of attributes to make that executable on a workflow engine. Okay, that's a basic idea. These kind of tasks, they can have different types. This small little human here means it's a human task. So this would be a process where everything is still done manually. So it pops up in some user um, task list saying, hey, you should enter the customer data in the CRM system. So that's kind of a totally manual process. We see that in, in some cases still around a lot. But of course, you could also have what's called a service task, so you could automate things. So now you can attach basically some logic to automatically call out to a, to a system or an API 
or whatever it is, an RPA bot. There, there are a lot of possibilities what you could hook in here. I will make an example um, uh, technically in a minute. Um, the, the example I'm using here is taken from, from the book. I released that uh, this week, actually. So it's out this week called Practical Process Automation. So there I use the same process that I walk you through um, in much more detail. So if you, if you want to dive a bit more into that and learn it like more step by step, I can totally recommend the book. I mean, I wrote it. I should probably be able to recommend it. Um, I have the link in the slides later on. Um, there's currently a sponsored version from Kamuna where you can get an electronic version for free. So it's, there's nothing stopping you from just having a look into it if it's interesting for you. Um, right. Technically, and that that's um, that gets interesting because it's about philosophy of different tools. So what I described so far, a workflow engine process automation with BPMN, there are a couple of vendors out there doing this, or there were vendors already for, for a couple of years. Um, you might recall these BPM tools, BPM suites, and big vendors, a lot of them um, actually populated that space. And one thing, um, that we as Kamunda do very differently um, is that what we call developer friendliness. So basically what we say, okay, we don't want to have a low-code tool where some non-technical person clicks together the whole process, but we basically want to say, okay, if this is a service task, we, we want you that you can basically attach some code whatever code you have. It could be um, Java, it could be Node.js, could be Python, whatever. It actually doesn't matter too much. So you can really um, attach code and this code implements the logic and then can call a REST endpoint, a SOAP endpoint, send a message or an MQP, um, call some whatever, an SAP system, um, whatever have you, right? So that's the basic idea. And this brings the whole um, workflow engine, the whole process automation into the space of the developer, right? And you can work with the best practices of a typical developer, like whatever, writing unit tests, doing CI, CD, and so on and so forth. Right? That's, um, that's one of the important things to know about Kamuna. And what's a workflow engine? In essence, I do a very quick intro here. Um, from my perspective, okay, you can define these process models, deploy it there, you can version that, not talking about these details, but sometimes very important because um, you might have to wait for um, the SIM card provisioning to be available and you change the logic of the process model, um, then the workflow engine can keep track of these kind of versions. But the most important features are you can keep durable state. So you can wait in tasks for if you want a long time. So basically we persist all the data um, in terms of, in case of Kamuna platform, it's a relational database. Um, this is a bit simplified here. You could imagine it's like, okay, I have process definition and then I have instances and I simply remember at which task I'm currently waiting. Right? And then you ha also have a scheduling mechanism where uh, the workflow engine can get active. For example, if some something is waiting for too long, if there's a timeout and these kind of things, okay. That's a workflow engine in essence. And if you look at how it works, and this is what I will show in a um, in a second in a demo, is that you really embed all these yeah, workflow engine process automation logic into your environment. Um, and this is, yeah, it's, it's pseudo code, but it's kind of Java-ish. Um, so you could imagine it like you have your own code, which provides like a REST endpoint, for example, to do customer onboarding. And this then invokes the API of, a, of the workflow engine, for example, to kick off a new um, process instance. And then you have kind of a marker flowing through that process model saying, okay, the first thing I have to do in this case is to charge the credit card. What does it mean? That's what I meant earlier on. Now we attach some code, which is then basically called by the workflow engine in order to do whatever it needs to do, right? And if it, if it needs to wait there, um, then the state is persisted in the database and the workflow engine remembers, okay, I still have that one process instance um, waiting there where I have to charge the credit card. That's in a nutshell what the workflow engine is doing. Architecture wise, I don't have a lot of time to, to, to explain that in detail, just to give you a couple of pointers and happy to answer questions if they come up later on. Um, 
If you do microservices, for example, that's what a lot of people currently are asking for. Um, you could embed or see the workflow engine logically as part of that one microservice. So one microservice could use a workflow engine basically to implement certain yeah, cross automation logic, which then might include orchestrating like other microservices, for example. So in this case, a workflow engine can, can do microservices orchestration. Um, you could, I um, don't want to go into details of this, but if you're cutting edge, you could also do um, function orchestration with such a workflow engine. Um, if you're not that cutting edge, you might have a monolithic application, which might be a good thing, actually. So we have a lot of software vendors embedding the workflow engine within their own software as a monolith and then um, still use the workflow engine to, yeah, to automate processes within that software very often. Also to be able to deliver like, um, yeah, default processes or templates and then be able to customize the software um, for the customer. But just wanted to draw a couple of options. There are even more. So we're currently launching our own cloud offering. That means you could also um, use the workflow engine as a managed service, um, public cloud, private cloud. So there, there are a lot of these kind of options. But I don't want to confuse you with all the options. Let's let's look into, into one example. And I always love doing a quick demo um, in order to make it more, more tangible. And the um, if you look on the slides, we'll get the slides later on. Um, there's a link to GitHub. So I pushed all the code I'm showing here also to my GitHub account. So you can um, play around with that later on yourself. It's actually very simple. So I use Java here, so I'm not sure how many people are, are, are fluent in Java here in the room. I can't easily ask now, so I, I just assume at least a couple of people might hopefully follow me. Um, but on a high level, the, the idea is that I have, a let's say, a normal development project. And this in this case, it's Java and Spring Boot, normal Maven project, nothing very special here, nothing very fancy. Um, but I added the um, BPMN process. Um, to that process, uh, project as a resource. Technically, that process definition is a simple XML file. So I'm, I'm, I'm normally not looking at the XML too much. Um, just that you know, it's nothing magic. It's an XML file, which basically defines that um, process model. And then within that process model, I can, what I said earlier on, I can make connections to the code. So for example, I said, okay, um, entering the customer in the CRM system should be done by a so-called CRM adapter. And this, as I'm in Spring, um, could be uh, Spring B, right? And then I can write whatever code I need in order to write or to basically um, put the, the customer into the CRM system. I have, at, at the edge, I, I provide a REST controller where I say, hey, I wanna um, onboard a new customer. So I put, I, I call a REST endpoint to put the customer and this, kicks off a new process instance. That's what I had on the slide early on, right? Um, one other thing, um, when triggering the SIM card, and that's now interesting, um, I don't attach the code as I showed it here, but I use another mechanism and that's more or less the default we're currently um, uh, yeah, recommending. That's using what we call external task. It works a little bit like a queuing system. So the workflow engine basically says, okay, I wait here until somebody, some code subscribes um, to the workflow engine saying, hey, I can do SIM provisioning, right? And that means I have some other piece of code here. It's also Java, but I also have the JavaScript version for everybody not fluent in Java. Um, it's a very simple um, Spring Boot application again. Um, and what it basically does, it basically says, hey, I can subscribe to SIM provisioning. And then I, again, I have very, uh, I have all the possibilities I have in Java to write the code, what should happen when, um, when I wanna provision a SIM card. I, I stop that for a second, I kill it. And now we can do um, one thing and then we are almost done. What I can do is I can um, send a REST request to the 
um, to the edge, to the to my rest controller here. So this one, right? Um, what you can see is we received the um, the request. We created a customer in the CRM system and in the CRM uh, in the billing system. This are these two pieces of code, lovely code here. <laughs> and what you can also see is that um, these systems, um, these workflow engines, they have tooling around that. And I always love to show that because it, I think it, it gives you a good idea how the workflow engine really works. Um, so, da, 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 da. Um, in in case of Kamunda, um, that uh, there there are a couple of tools. I just look into cockpit at the moment. Cockpit is for the um, let's say technical operations. So an infrastructure person, um, an operations person could look into. Um, what's currently going on? Ah, there's one process instance um, currently running. Um, you see all the like timestamps, so you get a lot of audit data, what the workflow engine did in the past, and you, you, you see that it's currently waiting for triggering the SIM card. You can also look at that on a, on a, on a process level, um, which I also like showing sometimes. Um, hey, my curl. Um, uh, let's say some nice chat, Mike Burn too. So if I refresh that, I have now two instances waiting for triggering the SIM card. And I had a couple of them already in the past. And I have a lot of things like lovely um, reporting and so on and so forth. But um, what I can do next is if I restart this, um, what we call a worker, so this piece of code, um, then it subscribes to the workflow engine saying, OK, now I can do SIM card provisioning. And then you will see that the um, basically the process here also advanced. And that's a very powerful mechanism. So first of all, it allows that the workflow engine could run in the cloud because you subscribe to it from wherever you are. It allows that you really have control over the worker. You could even like either scale it out if you need to, but you could also limit the number of things it processes and uh, whatever. There are a lot of a lot of um, reasons why this is cool. <laughs> and I think what I also have, let's quickly look at that. I also have the same thing in, 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 in um, Node.js, more or less not because it's a best practice to use as many programming language as you like, uh, as you um, as you have, but just to show that you can um, do that in basically every programming language. So um, in this case, same thing, I connect um, to my workflow engine saying this kind, in this case, I do SIM registrations, which is, Sorry if I'm jumping too fast, but this one, SIM registration. And that means um, if I run this node app, yeah, it's already running, um, then this does the last step, right? So um, if I if I look at, let's see if we get that on the screen and then I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, blop. So that's the, uh, this one, that's this one. Oh, come on. So this one. This one and no test. This one, uh, yeah, it could work. And now I give it another request. Uh, we're like this, cool. Um, and let's say now, say Simon. Then we see that ah, on every of these systems. Okay. Probably not that fancy. And just to make one last remark, and um, this is really this is part of the code. So if I um, if I change it, for example, saying okay, we don't no longer need the billing system, I could simply um, remove it, um, redeploy that thing, or restart the Spring Boot application, and then um, it will actually um, work differently, right? So um, uh, where I am. So what you can see, it's only in the CRM system. It's no longer in the billing system, but um, we got it in the SIM. And then you can also see stuff like um, where's Nick here? Um, how, yeah, time is okay. Mm. Um, so you see that you have like different versions, right? And a lot of other fancy stuff. Cool. Um, okay. Um, I skipped a lot of things. I just wanted to give you a feeling what 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 I mean if I say um, workflow engine. Um, right, I haven't haven't said anything about me. I normally say that a little bit later when I delivered at least some value for you, hopefully. Um, yeah, my name is Bendrick. I'm co-founder and chief technologist of Komunda. 
Um, I'm doing workflow all my life. That's what I always say. So I started like 15, 20 years back. I contributed to a couple of open source um, workflow engines. Um, if you want to reach out to me, you find me on Twitter. Um, you find me on LinkedIn. There's my homepage. There's my email address. Um, don't hesitate to reach out if there's anything. Um, right. That was process automation. I don't have the time to really go in the same depth into um, what's called decision automation, but the um, the basic idea is relatively simple. So um, there is a second standard. So this is a BPMN for the um, process models and there's so-called DMN, decision model and notation, um, which defines decision tables. So these kind of tables, let's look at them uh, for real. So this is how um, such a decision table could look like, where I say, I have certain inputs, like, hey, what's the payment time? What's the customer region score? Um, how's the neighborhood, basically? What's the monthly payment? And depending on these data, I um, decide if there's a manual check for that onboarding necessary or not, right? And then every of these um, rows is a separate rule. And you could either use that um, like standalone, so you can put in data and get back like a result, or um, you could also hook that into a process model where you say, okay, I now pass on some data I know in the uh, in the in the process, get back a result, and probably act on this. Like that's this pattern, like saying, okay, now I invoke the rule table, get back a result, and then I either go this way or the other. That's a very typical pattern, actually. And that goes very often hand in hand. And as you can see, that's very powerful um, for a lot of reasons. So um, it's readable also by non-technical folks. It's much easier to, um, to change, to adjust. Um, you get also a lot of audit data, like what's the typical decision? How often did we do this? Um, probably you, um, yeah, and so on and so forth. A lot of, lot of cool things. <laughs> cool. Um, what's Camunda? Um, that's the tool I just used, um, it's an open source process automation platform. So we have that workflow engine, we have a decision engine, um, it's all open source. So you can um, just go to um, GitHub, to our homepage, download it, get started. Um, you can use it, what I did in the demo um, via Spring Boot Sorter, for example. The business model is around an enterprise edition, so you can buy the enterprise edition, get a couple of additional features, um, get support and such, and so on and so forth. Yeah, we're supporting BPM and DMN, that's what I said. We're, um, yeah, we're pretty widely adopted, so it's not kind of a garish project. Um, I, I always like adding these numbers, especially for people which might know us for a while, because they are always surprised by that. So even if we found it 2008, um, oh, we found it 2008, <laughs> so we're quite old in a way, um, but we're growing uh, very fast at the moment. So um we're having roughly 400 enterprise customers at the moment and a huge community. So um, you can test that. Go in the forum, for example, ask a question, and you normally always get a get an answer very, very quickly. Cool. And yes, uh, I wanted to add that because we are having a quite quite a run at the moment. So that was for me, that was kind of a popcorn week. Um, so I'm super happy to have this kind of meetup today because we had the um, Series B announcement um, on Monday. Um, so we did a quite a quite a good financing round and accelerating um, the growth currently. So that's pretty exciting what's happening there. And I released the book, um, which I was talking about earlier on. Finally, so I have it on the desk. Every mistake you you find now um, can't be corrected anymore. So um, <laughs> can still report it. Good. Um, last slide um, before we switch to Simon. Um, if you, if you ask yourself like what can I do with that, um, the answer is like a lot and a lot of different things. So um, it's not tied to any industry. I mean, today we're probably talking a bit more about um, insurance, but um, we also have customers in uh, finance, telecommunication, but also uh, media, aviation, and you name it. So it's basically all across the board. And you can also see that a lot of like different types of processes, like customer onboarding is one example, but also like, for example, order fulfillment, claim settlement, whatever, underwriting. Um, like um, one of my favorite use cases, the NASA is um, using that with a perseverance robot basically to process data the robot sends to Earth in order to, um, to calculate the next steps um, in space. That's pretty cool. Yeah, okay.
that was very, very, very quick overview for me. Um, I would stop sharing actually um, to leave the stage to um, Simon. Thanks, Ben. That was fabulous. Um, really informative, and I hope I can I can build on on what you've put <laughs> in there. Um, this is again, it, it's about how we've approached process automation and, and our enhanced decision making within within Kavea and and building on what's there from Commander. Um, I'm not as nice as Bert, so here's about me. Um, I've spent a long time in IT. Half my life has been working in IT, and I've got a, a background in a number of things, not just uh, the business process and workflow. Um, and I've been at Kavea for three years, and I've spent the last 16 of, of my professional life as an architect. I want to start with talking about the role of IT in business processes. <clears throat> so when I started many, many years ago in IT, um, IT departments were, they, they did IT to the business. Um, the, the business was a, an afterthought almost in software. And, and it was the IT departments that chose the software and rolled it out. Uh, the business had little or no say in what, what was provisioned and how it was provisioned. Um, throughout my time, I've seen a lot of IT departments then change to using internal suppliers, with maybe you are acting as internal suppliers. Requirements coming from the business, but the IT department still made a lot of the decisions about the ultimate packages that were put in or, or how they were provisioned and how they were used. And then in the last few years, I've seen a lot more of having a closer relationship with the business. And some of the, the most important people I speak to uh, day to day are, are senior business stakeholders and, and needing to understand what they need in order to to run the business and, and make the operations side of the of the of the business work and so i'm still looking at computerizing traditional processes and we need to now move away from that computerizing what people do to looking to what is that process what is it that people do how do they do it and how can we make it better for them i also want to look at the perspectives of a business process so in, in the past, we've often talked about the, the various journeys. So we might have a customer journey, an, an agent journey, a, a third party journey. And those people are all essentially doing the same thing. Uh, that business process that's defined in that XML or in that, that image, um, that defines a process outcome. And that might be a small piece of um, a bigger process in terms of it being a sub process. And, we might have many potential views onto those processes. The, the top diagram uh, up here is, is essentially what, what we started out with for our claims process. And we started off with the big boxes. What happened? Can we validate what happened? Can we validate that you're insured? Whose is the liability? Who do we instruct to put it right? And how do we settle it? And then we broke down from there and looked at what the sub processes were, sub processes were what the different outcomes we wanted from these big these big blocks and, and broke it down to what are the minor outcomes and how do we break it down until we get down to the small pieces where we use the technologies within Comunda um, to make those external calls. And we use uh, Node.js to call out to microservices to do that. But in terms of those processes, we can have very different views onto the same process our policyholders want to report and monitor their claims. Our partners want to see consolidated data, which is great from the history views that we get in those heat maps. And we have third parties who might want to view and provide evidence to us. Um, and our colleagues, uh, the people who run these claims through and, and help people out, they need to manage that whole process. And so when traditionally those things have been done by different teams, um, it's been very difficult to get them to join up. And what I'm attempting to do uh, with Commander within our claims business is, is provide a single process that everybody uses. So it doesn't matter if you're the policy holder, you're a partner, a third party, or one of the colleagues, you're going to use the same process to get that business outcome. And what we're going to do is present a different view onto that process, depending on how you approach it. What am I trying to do that's different and how do we approach business processes now? I've taken some of the the experience from 
uh, days of doing development and 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 systems development and systems research and and, and design and looking at the the old traditional separation of concerns and where that might we can look at that from a, a development perspective of making sure that things do one thing and do it well from a microservices perspective. What I'm trying to do in a in a business process is separate the what from the how. What we do is what we do. Um, that that's what we that's what we do as a business, and it doesn't really change very often. What does change is how we want to do it, and it what's it's what differentiates us as a, as a business from other insurance companies and and how they do things. We can look at the the impact that these have on customer satisfaction, our costs, and lots of other things. And, and by utilizing the BPM systems, it allows us to change how we do things without altering the business outcomes. We can take out that that step that Vern put in his, his process and say, yeah, we're not going to put that into the billing system anymore. We're going to do that a different way. Or we're going to change the, the order that we do things. Or we're going to try a different sub-process. And traditional systems in terms of the data, hold all of that data together. So your business data and your process data are all lumped up in the same thing. And what we can do now is is separate out that business data from the process data and make sure that we've got a detail, we can do detailed analysis of of both of those and make it easier because we don't have to uh, think about that separation when when we do that analysis. The other separation that we can do is we can separate our partners from each other. One of the the key things in Comunda that that Ben didn't touch on um, is the ability to deploy different versions of the same process based on which tenant you are. So I can have several several customers in a multi-tenant environment and have slightly different processes for each tenant, but have them ingested in the same way and kicked off by the same endpoints at the beginning so in the in the process that Vern showed of of taking that payment and and setting up the sim provisioning it could be a different process for different mobile providers but have ultimately the same top level process and that's what we're aiming to do with our claims where we might have some of our customers who want to offer different functionality uh, different services and USPs, and we can take those into account and and make sure that that gets done just for those cust- just for the customers of those partners. The what we do remains the same, but how we do it is different. <clears throat> so how do we go about defining processes? If we want to look to automation, we need well-defined, repeatable processes. If it's not well-defined, if it's not repeatable, we don't know what we can do automatically. We don't know when we need to do it. There are some quick wins, as Bernd pointed out, you know, third-party integrations, external data filings. Part of this talk is about how it affects us as a regulated industry. And we've got to do multiple uh, pieces of reporting out um, in order to to make sure that we're compliant. There are things like the the motor insurance database for car insurance, and we we can make sure that we can push that out straight away by calling a service task, and each process that goes through, that's gonna get pushed out. So we won't then have to do uh, bulk extracts of data in order to upload to our, our regulators. We can make sure that everybody's dealt with as soon as possible. We have standard actions and sub processes. So where something is always the same, we can make it standard, or we can pull out a different a different piece, a different strand uh, for particular customers, but we can make sure that we've got that standardization across the piece that allows us to have a well-defined and repeatable process. And we can make those specializations, and the specializations when we define the process, they be, remain transparent no matter how you look at it, because we're using that single layer and that single uh, that single process in the middle with the different views, it doesn't matter where you look at it from. Any specialization I put in, any particular foible that comes in, it's just available. And we can use that to implement A-B type testing for processes and see how things are affected as we, we change individual aspects of a process or individual aspects of, of how we do things. On the decision piece, um, again, we've got the same 
considerations around defining our decisions. But what that decision process and the DMN gives us is that ability to be a, a consistent application of rules and it's always there. We, we don't have manual out of date processes. You know, there isn't that piece of paper that gets passed around the office as it might have done in years gone by to say, oh, if it's this customer, this is what we do. If it's that customer, this is what we do. These are the limits that such a person can can deal with in terms of payments. And, and this is how we this is how much we'll we'll pay for for this, that or the other. We can get consistent application of our standard decisions. And the decision that, that Bern showed you was, was one of the, the very simple ones that Commander is capable of. And you can actually nest these and, and make them multi-layered. You can make them ridiculously complex if you want to, but you can also make them uh, feed into each other so that you have lots of simple decisions that build up into a complex decision ultimately. And again, you can make specializations for individual partners or to, to introduce A-B testing or one of the things that I've, I've talked about internally is about being able to make changes to how we deal with claims um, based on circumstances around it. So it might be that if we have a, an extreme weather event and people are ringing up about home insurance because of flooding, and we know that there's flooding in a particular case, we can introduce decisions or change decisions around that in terms of how we deal with the customer and what that process looks like without actually having to change the process very much. What we change is some of the decisions that are implemented and how they're implemented. And that can be turned around very quickly. And again, anything that we do around specialization for A-B testing for partners, those specializations are transparent to everybody, no matter how they look at the process. When we start to put all this together, um, we start looking at where we might use um, the pieces that we've got uh, and make it work for us. And one of those areas that I'm looking at and, and keen to use is, is by combining those features uh, to use an integration with data science to allow complex analysis of data for decisions, but also to introduce feedback loops. So hopefully you can see we've got a service call out here to a data science that might identify conflicts um, against a, a policy and the way that somebody wants to make a claim. And we can move on and, and based on the confidence of that call, um, we can say, yeah, we've got low confidence in what's come out, so we need to have a person do that review. Or it might be a high confidence, and we might say, actually, randomly, we're going to send 10% of our piece, 10% of our work through to to someone to, to look at so that we've got a little bit of oversight on this process. And we can change the way that this works using the DMN or using BPM to, to decide how much or how little of that data has to go to a real person. Whichever way it goes through, we can set the conflict flag. And if we've actually got pushed this through on a person, we can send that data back to data science to give us that feedback loop to continually improve the decisions that our AI is making and, and introduce uh, reduce the amount of actual uh, human input and, and interaction that needs to be done. But we can change that on the fly and make sure it comes in. And we can validate things through human inputs however we like, and we can always make sure we get that feedback. We can then use other external data sources. So the call outs that we make, we could bring in weather forecasts and enhance the intelligence of work assignments um, through uh, work management tools. And what we're ultimately hoping to do is use some of these features to actually preempt things with our customers. So if we've got that weather forecast data and we know how that affects people and where it's going to affect, we can start pushing out to our customers to say, be aware that there's a there's an incoming weather event that might be a problem and maybe move your expensive stuff, move the stuff you care about upstairs if you're in a flood risk area. And so we can start to add a bit of value to our customers by taking away the pain that comes before the claim and make sure they don't have to do the claim in the first place. But if they do have to claim, then we'll be able to get through that as quickly as possible using the process management and enhanced decision making. So what's next for us is to get this implemented, get it working fully um, with Commander and, and within our systems. Look at this 
as a an opportunity to streamline some of our processes, make sure that they're as good as they can be, and make sure that they're accessible to the people they need to be, whether that's within Kavea or whether that's with our our partners, whether it's our customers and, and whether it's third parties that we have to deal with and make sure that we treat our customers fairly and get everything to them as soon as we can and, and when we can. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add in, Bernd? Um, no, not not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, the, so, I think that was a good overview of what you're doing. I always like to have VPM and models in there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the the, um, the the data science one is the the one that's that's exciting our data scientists because it gives them a nice standard way of putting feedback loops in as well, which is one of the areas that they often have problems with. Um, I looked at some of the some of the maps that we have um, set up for claims, and they they're, they're quite scary um, <laughs> uh, when you when you when you dig down into them. So that that five um, layer piece uh, where we had the five boxes about what we're doing that that breaks down into a much bigger. I'm just trying to find the the overview process, and it, it it's a that then becomes this beast. Um, if I can just share the correct screen. So this beast of a process here um, that deals with our claims and, and settlement and lots of sub processes to make it go through. So that, that gives you a good example of how we can we can do our ethanol process at the beginning about what happened and what that what that leads into where we create an incident process uh, we we add participants we add assets and losses and then we look at indemnity as to is the policy valid where we use dmn to do that is it like who's got liability and again we've got dmn there and then we've got the parallel processing of, of multiple claim processes. So if there's a third party involved, we might treat that as two different claims, one for our policyholder and one for the third party. But it, it becomes a, a, a huge piece of, of lovely process. <laughs> um, and, and this again is showing off one of the one of the great things from from Comunda that, that sets it apart from some of the um, some of the competitors in the Kawemo piece that allows us to do that design with with our business partners um, without having to go into technical detail about what's a service task and what's it doing. It allows them to just map out exactly how they want it to work. So as we move down into the ethanol process, we get into some of the areas where we're doing the calls out for services. We've got uh, human interaction and, and we've got more service pieces when we go out. And it's that automation in the, in the service tasks that are really difficult to to, to introduce and to change as you go through and, and as your processes evolve and being able to map it out in the BPM and separate it out from the, the layers underneath, whether that be microservices or RPA or, or monolithic um, systems with, with calls in uh, through REST or however, then it, it, makes it, it makes it really easy to make those changes and just try things and, and push it through. And, and, and get and get the business engaged in it so that they've got some buy-in in, into what you're doing. No, oh, that's impressive. When did you um where did you start the whole um BPM and Commander mm -hmm. endeavor? Um we we looked at a competitor um a couple of years ago. When I started at, at Kavea nearly three years ago, we were looking at different uh, BPM products for for a small part of what we wanted to do in claims. And there were some people involved in that who I think were swayed by some of the, the no code mm -hmm. um, people. They say, oh yeah, you don't need to be able to code to do this. And actually it turns out, yes, you do. And you also get tied into what they do. So when, we start, when I started looking at this again, um, that was probably about 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. And we'd, we'd done some work with Commanda and some of the other um bpm providers and, and commander just just sort of edged it on a number of things in in terms of the 
the reporting, the histories, the, those heat maps are a great thing to show people in business. It shows you, you know, how things are going. And even if they don't necessarily understand exactly what it's showing them, it's pretty pictures and it, it gives them a, a bit of confidence. But that data that you showed around auditing is really important in that regulated environment to be to be able to show this is what we did, this is when we did it, and this was who this is who did it. And, and that 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 really helps. In terms of defining our our claims journeys, that probably started um, nine about nine months ago. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got the BAs are, are working with the business to look at what the processes need to be, and then we get our engineers involved to look at how we can implement the the things at the back end to 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 drive the microservices, and we've got our developers who are putting a front end on there so that each of these user aspects here has its own defined front end um, in a react um, uh, react components in a react based uh, spa um, that's going to show the things that need to be shown at that point and what we're working on at the minute is using um, the listeners that are available so within come under where we set up a, a task listener for human tasks or user tasks where it actually sends out an event via Kafka um, that gets sent to a WebSocket server to drive to mm -hmm. drive the front end through WebSockets mm -hmm. and give mm -hmm. that immediate interaction to people. Mm -hmm. And what that allows us to do is where we where define a journey like this um, as an ethanol journey where we have to select the policy and then do the capture circumstances and assets and losses, we can pop those screens up to the user in the right order, in the right mm -hmm. format. And it doesn't matter what happens in the process, and it doesn't matter if the process changes, the front end doesn't need to change. It just shows the right front mm -hmm. end, the right components to do what we need to do at that time. And so it gives us a, a huge amount of flexibility in, in how the business can, can have that say in how things are going to do. And it goes back to the thing that people are, are, are sick of hearing me talk about on a day-to-day -day basis, which is separating out the what from the how that's been my, my big thing about it. And, you know, what we do is insurance. How we do it is what sets us apart from everybody else that does insurance. That's no, that's pretty <laughs> impressive, actually. Love it. Um, and it's pretty quick as well. I mean, um, a couple of like say nine months. And what's the current state? Are you in production with that already with the claim handling or? Uh, no, we're, we're, we're working towards that. We, We've also got the this 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 issue that uh, insurance claims is huge, yeah. uh, and when you've got a system that's been uh, built upon for years and years and years, there's, there's lots of things that you need to take into account. So we're we're looking at this from how we do it in terms of individual peril types. So the first thing that we're looking at is where your vehicle's been stolen and it hasn't been recovered. So we're just going to pay you out if it's a valid claim. And, and so that's a really simplistic journey. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we can we separate those out um, anyway through our IVR when people call in. Mm -hmm. And so we can make sure that that gets sent to a specific set of people and they know how to use it. And we can introduce this into the into the business gently. Um, it allows us to get to grips with how to use Communda, how to make everything work together, and also means that we're not doing the thing that I talked about in the first screen, which is we're not doing IT to the business. We need to work with them and make sure that mm -hmm. their operational yeah. processes fit in with that yeah. business process as well. Yeah, I find that actually one of the most important pieces, and you also that, that said that along the lines that even if you start to sketch out the process with the business analysts, you started involving engineering relatively quickly. Yeah. Um, and I find um, key factors actually to success, not to to trying to, that's what I see sometimes, to to draw a lot of models, to to analyze everything, and then later on start implementing and just under, then realize that you didn't understand BPMN well, that you didn't understand how to model executable processes and so on and so forth. So I find that very important to go step by step to analyze it, to directly implement it, to, to see what effect it has on the UI, how to build the UI, how to, what's the influence on how you do the process model, learn along the way. Um, well, that's, that sounds, sounds great, actually. The, the other thing that it gives us is 
because we're we're approaching it in uh, in that thin layer horizontally, it means we get to the complex bit like making payments out to people quickly. We don't look at all of the right. What do we need to gather in terms of third mm -hmm. parties and have people been killed and this, that, and the other? We've got a really simple um, first step that allows us to hit. I think some of the figures we looked at today was um, it's going to be roughly about 60 percent of the capabilities of our claim system is going to be covered by that first peril um, they might not be fully functioned and, and fully fled, fleshed out um, but we're going to have those capabilities there and so we're going to hit the things that are awkward soon in the process mm -hmm. and so that when we go, when we go on mm -hmm. as we build on 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 top of that it's going to be quicker to get there when we look at the next peril that we're going to do we might only have to change like five percent of our process and, and and things like that to, to make it quicker i noticed there was a, a there was a, a come under um, come under contact style piece on insurance last month and i think it was the indiana farm bureau again mm -hmm. and they were saying that something they'd implemented they'd done in a third of the time of what it would normally take them because they were using come under and it, it's that sort of speed that we're looking to get we want to be able to turn things around quickly and make mm -hmm. sure that we we keep ourselves ahead of the game in the business that makes a lot of sense yeah what i what i sometimes hear um if you start introducing it is that in the very beginning sometimes projects even get a bit delayed because um if you start sketching out the models um you, you probably facilitate more discussions on what yeah. you really need to implement <laughs> Um, but that always saves time in the later stage because um, then you implement what you really need, and um, which is also kind of a huge gain. Um, we have two or three questions. Let me wrap that up. I have one or two slides left, um, which I quickly show, but um, it's kind of fits to what you said as well. And um, I, I find that also important. The, the typical journey we see customers going through is um, to start with a pilot. That's what I always recommend. If you, if you have an idea, hey, this looks interesting, start with a proof of concept. And that doesn't have to be very complicated. And I mean, you should have development resources. That's what you need. But then it can either pair up with us, pair up with the partner, pair up with the integrator you like, um, with your own developers. and do something in, in a couple of days, you should be able to get get going. And then you have learned normally enough to make a decision and, and start doing a project. And only later on, scale it out. I mean, um, we don't do that, or we do that for quite a while now. So we have customers going on, on really huge scale. So if you look at like, there are a couple of talks from um, Goldman Sachs, for example, a couple of others, which really scale out the adoption quite, quite heavily. Um, this is kind of the end result, but you should always take it step by step. I find that super important. And we talked about this. Um, if you want to get going, um, I mean, if you're very technical, um, we have a couple of get started guides. Just play around with it. The, the thing I did today, a couple of lines of code, but you can can play around with it. That normally helps to get an idea. If you're not that technical, reach out. We can also discuss like how we can organize something for you. If you want to learn more, right, I released the book. Um, there's a free electronic version available, so I'm not trying to sell you a book. <laughs> but if you want to um, if you want to learn more about that, I, I think it's a good resource to, to, to get started. Um, thank you very much. Um, we have four questions, and you might have more questions. So if you still have questions, you can type it in the chat or um, use Slido for that, because I wanted to at least answer them because a couple of people um, did some work with it. And the first one I would answer, because that's that's a quick one, can DMN be used separate from BPMN? Yes, definitely. Um, we have customers using only DMN just for making decisions. Um, you can even use it in two different ways. The one would be really stateless. So it can basically hand in some data. It makes a decision based on the table and gives you back a result. That's working, or it can use it in a in a kind of stateful way. That means you have a repository, you have versioned um, uh, decision tables, you keep an audit history of what decisions you made. Again, for compliance reason, that can be interesting. Like, why did you do that decision? That's something I discussed with a lot of insurances. Uh, they have problems with machine learning, for example, because it's not always easy to to document why a decision was made, it's uh, super easy um, with DMN. 
Okay. Uh, one of that's one of the things that we're doing as well. We we're using the DMN within BPMN uh, models uh, in some cases, but we're also using the API calls into the engine just to yeah. to make those decisions on the front end without having to go into a process. And it's in it, it's great that you can have the same decision um, used or the same decision model used within and without BPM. Yeah, totally agreed. So what else do we have? Hey, come on, I said it's answered. Thank you. Um, how does it fit in with AI and ML? No, I'm not sure when exactly this question was answered. So if it's a general question, I'm not sure if Simon, if you have a general answer to that, it's kind of a broad question. Um, in, in terms of the, I, I don't necessarily have a general answer. I know that we're looking at it in terms of the, the data that, because AI, AI and ML is going to take data and do things with it, we're, we're pushing our data through it in order to to feed our AI and ML, as I, as I pointed out in that um, in that mm -hmm. small process loop. Um, but also the other thing that we want to look at is to take that data and um, augment the, the tools that you get through, come under optimize and things like that, to take that process data and, like I said, having the business data and the process data separate, we can feed those both in. And we can look at what outcomes come and, and maybe even use AI and ML to drive the journeys and drive drive the process and, and the routes it takes. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, probably the next one is also for you. Um, what yeah. are you using for <laughs> MIBI? Um, at, at the moment, we're we're moving towards um, using Power BI um, for our our BI and MI, um, but we're we're also looking to um, the the use of Data Lake for for as much of the data as we can. And again, I'd I'd envisage all our process data going in there so that we can we can use that for analysis and see how things affect people and 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 how things affect our claims. As we go forward, cool. Um, I can take the last one because it's kind of connected. Does Kamunda has any plans with process mining? Um, that's a hard question, actually. So we are um, just to get everybody on um, on board. Process mining basically means to look into. Yeah, kind of log data, audit data, and probably also other systems of writing, like your typical ERP system po possibly writes a couple of logs. And then you read that, analyze that, and try to derive, to guess the process basically from these log files to understand the typical use cases to understand kind of legacy chaos, like how's the process currently implemented. And um, there are some parts of it which we are currently addressing. So, for example, if you're doing an event-driven architecture, um, like you said, Kafka earlier on. So, if you have Kafka and a lot of domain events flowing around, um, you can map them to process models in order to understand or to, to basically analyze certain data, which we can also do for um, the data or workflow engine writes, like the heat maps and stuff we saw earlier on. So, we can do that also. Um, on top of these um, events. And that's a little bit of process mining, if you will. So we can discover the process, we can map data to it. So that's something we we target for two reasons. First of all, um, very often an end-to-end -end process um, is started before it enters the Kamunda workflow engine. There are other systems which, which are playing ping pong before you come to the workflow engine. And then when you call out to a system, maybe that also does a couple of ping pong things. And it's very often good to understand the really end-to-end -end view. And also event-driven architectures like um, going for choreography, going with Kafka um, is pretty interesting to look at. So we're we're doing things in there, but we're not targeting kind of what typical process mining tools are. So we're not scraping log files. We are not doing that as kind of a standalone thing. So hang on. Um, hmm, somehow, uh, OK, this is answered. So we have one last question, um, which is kind of a big one again. <laughs> How do you bridge the gap between a sketched out model and a fully executable model? Do you want to answer that from your perspective? I have a generic answer, but probably yeah, yeah, I can... more interesting. Well, maybe or maybe not. Um, <laughs> I think 
<laughs> Although we're looking at using our own front end um, to to present the the user tasks, um, what's the, the process that we, we go through is, is looking at using the Commander front end to make sure that the processes go through as we'd expect. And that, that sketched out model in Kawemo, it, it's really easy to replace those service, to change those service tasks into, into user tasks so that you can see how it flows through. And then building out just individual pieces at the back to make it work in terms of how we, we get those those external pieces working, whether they're through an API, whether it's through Java or, or however it might be, and and just build up on it. And I think, as I pointed out with the the five blocks at the beginning, you know, that's the original sketched out model of what a claims process looks like, um, th those five things. And then it's about breaking those down into their constituent parts and, and just keep going until you get to the bottom. It's a really, it's a really finicky thing to do. In some cases, there are some people who love that type of thing uh, and some people who really hate doing that sort of thing. Um, I recently did a, a lunch and learn um, within Kavea that that took something that's um, almost uniquely British and, and also something that I've found over the years causes a lot of discussion and, and argument with people. And it, it's how to make a cup of tea. And over the, the sort of 15 or 20 years I've worked in, in workflow and process management, I found this to be a great example of how to try and get people to understand the complexities of business processes and processes generally. Because making a cup of tea or a cup of coffee is something that people do, you know, loads, you know, tens, hundreds of times a week. Um, but if you put and I, I know this from experience, if you put 10 people in a room and ask them to come up with a process for how to make a cup of tea, you'll get at least 10 different answers on it. And people will always come up with things that you haven't thought of. So when I when I go through it, I tend to think of that's my sketched out thing. I boil the kettle, I get a mug, I put the tea bag in the mug, pour in the water, leave it to brew, remove the tea bag and add the milk. And, and actually, you, you can go to uh, you can take that down through through various steps until you get to my final version that I ended up with, which which is this sort of thing, <laughs> where uh, you know you you prepare the mugs and, and check the water level and boil the kettle in parallel because that you that's actually how you do it. You know when you when you break it down as a person, that's how you do it, uh, and then you have to wait for the the kettle to boil. Uh, you pour the water into the mugs, and but if the water's gone cold, you've got to come back here and boil it again. Leave it to brew. Remove the tea bag. Actually, do some. Do people want milk? And do they want different types of milk? And and then you add it. And so, what starts off as as a really simple, I go into the kitchen and make a cup of tea, becomes huge. And and it's really easy to get to huge really quickly. And so I find it better to to take gentle steps and and ease into it and break those things down. So, I think how do I get from a sketched out model to a fully functioning thing? It's by doing that breakdown and that analysis of those individual stages as I go through it. Totally agree. Um, the important, I, I find one important piece, which I think you said, but I'm not. I want to want to emphasize on that, is that when you when you do that, like doing these steps, um, always make it executable. Make it um, like an iterative process. Make it kind of normal software development and you then you sketch out the next step you try to to automate it probably write a test case um do things yeah. and then you you get there and then you also learn a lot like hey what's a good granularity should i do that in code should i do that in the model should i have a sub model should i have this and that and um as yeah. it, everything in life just do it and, and and learn along the way and i think that that making it executable goes to one of the other things that that's real I found really important in in this from a a development perspective is don't change two things at once <laughs> you won't know which thing's broken it um yeah. so yeah d deal with them one at a time and go through and check it and then move on to the yeah. next like the, the the thing that I showed doesn't actually work because it pops itself back into a parallel process without another token coming in. So you mm -hmm. never get out of that parallel process if you go back in. And, and that's one thing I learned from that. <laughs> yeah. And um, one remark, um, 
because that's sometimes also also an idea. I don't see two different models. I mean, you you might do a very high level, like that's what the process should do. But then you have that one operational model which you refine and make executable. It's not a separate thing. It's the same thing. Also, business analysts should look at. That's also important. And, cool. And and the other thing, just to go on that, is that top level with the, all the boxes, that might be the thing that you show to customers to let them see yeah. where they are in their journey, whereas the, the pieces underneath it are actually what's happening, and, and you don't want to expose that to anybody. Yeah, agreed. Cool. I think we don't have any, any more questions at the moment. And we're also at the... The, Great, uh, yeah, I think hour, that's everything right? then. Unless anyone's got anything like they'd like to add, thank you very much. Um, I just want to yeah. thank you. I just want to say I'm I'm Becky O'Farrell. I'm the digital recruitment partner, so I'll hang around for a few minutes afterwards if anyone wants to chat about anything else. And yeah, thank you very much, Simon and and Bernard. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thank you.